Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of IEEE Pune's podcast Beyond Conversations. On today's episode, our guest is Vedik Trivedi. Vedik completed an undergrad in journalism from the Stony Brook University of New York. Since then, he has worked as a news reporter and economics writer in many notable platforms such as Buttonwood Tree, The Debt Wire and The Osprey. More recently, he specializes as a business writer and works as an editor at The Daily Brief and Industry Life. Currently, he is pursuing a master's degree in journalism from the University of Columbia in New York. On today's podcast, he speaks about how he got admits to the top five universities in the United States, his educational experience at the two universities, the most important skills and principles for a journalist, and his process of writing a journalistic piece, and so much more. Good morning, Vedic. It's great to have you on our show. How are you today? It's good to be here. I'm doing well. It's a sunny day. It's a good day. It's a sunny day in New York. Yeah, that's rare to happen during winters, but it is a sunny day. It's a blue sky. Okay. So first of all, can you introduce yourself to our guests? Sure. Uh, my name is Vedit Trivedi. I am 25. My, I'm from Bhopal. That's my hometown. And currently I'm doing my master's in journalism in business and economics at Columbia University. Okay. So the first step of your journalism career, how did you decide that you wanted to be a journalist? Oh, so the story for this goes back to when I was, I think, 10 or 11. Uh, you know, newspaper hawkers, we have newspaper hawkers in India. Yeah. And one day and that newspaper hawker randomly decided to throw the economist in my house. No one okay. reads in my house. I think he was out, out of papers. He had an extra magazine or something. Mm-hmm. And this was the year um, of 2009. Mm-hmm. India went through elections. And luckily, uh, the cover story of that magazine that month was the Indian elections. So I got very intrigued about it. I started flipping through it. And something else was happening on the other part of the globe. Uh, America and all the global developers. Yeah, they were going through a recession. Right. And I was like 11 years old, more or less. And I didn't even understand the word, word recession. But when I flipped through it, I could gauge what's happening. And right. that really sparked an interest in me because they explained things as if they were explaining it to a five year old kid. And I right. loved that. And I was like, all right. I won the cover of this match. That's why I penetrated this field. And so the passion went on. Yeah. Over the years, I did think of pivoting towards other fields. Uh, When I was really young, I wanted to be a lawyer. But I really liked this field. And during my undergrad days, what really cemented my interest in this field was I did a story and... I was the news editor for my college publication and I did a story. I just did it because I had to do it. And I thought that it was an interesting topic to be covered. So I covered it and it went viral on campus. Every time I walked anywhere, people stopped me and they were like, beautiful story that you wrote. Thank you for covering it. And I was like, all right. So there is some maybe kind of impact that just cemented my interest in it. That must be quite fulfilling for you. Oh, yeah, it was. It was. For the first time, I felt that the pen has some power. And I really enjoyed it. Nice. So your first foray into learning journalism formally was at Sunny, Stony yeah. Brook University of New York. So how did that come about? How did you choose the university? So when I was applying for this program, uh, I was 18 and I applied Mm -hmm. for five unis and I had this thing in my head that wherever I'm applying, it has to come in the top 10 bracket. Even going to 11th uni is a waste of money. Mm -hmm. So I picked out the top five unis and I applied to them. Luckily, I got in all of them, 
but Sony, uh, I wanted to go there because of its proximity to New York, not mm-hmm. because I'm crazy after New York, but I understand that New York is the publishing hub of this planet. The number of publications per square mile you find in New York, you will only find it in maybe London. So that's why I came to New York and Sony had a great program. Two of the professors that were teaching there, I read about them and I loved what they had done in their career. And that's why I went to Sony. Right. You said you got accepted into all five top universities that you applied to. Now, that's a really, really rare thing. If you go to the foreign, um, I mean, advisory kind of agencies that are out here in India, they always tell you don't apply to the first five. Always pick something safe because admissions out there are really, really competitive. So what do you think made you stand out? Uh, <clears throat> so let me tell you something straight off the bat. Uh, right? I, I was not a scholar in my school. Mm-hmm. I was one of the naughtiest kids in the school. Uh, I did manage to get into the scholar list every alternate year or once in two years. But I was never like a scholar through and through. Mm-hmm. It was more about learning things on on the street, kind of like life right. And literally, that's what I wrote. And I told them that why I'm so interested in this field. And they gave me an admission. Right. So you mean you had been writing for quite a while before applying for college? Uh, yes and no. So my school, my high school, we had this monthly magazine. They called it the Gallup or something. Mm-hmm. And I used to write for it. I think I got published in it once or twice. It was open for anyone. People were barely interested in writing it. I was mm-hmm. barely interested in writing it. Uh, but that was the first thing. And I used to write a lot for myself. I still try to do it once in a while. And writing, I don't know, I really liked it through my life. And that's what I did. I told them that these are the things that I like. This is the kind of a person I am. They gave me an admission. So being genuine in your process was the key? Always, always. I tell this to everyone. But not just in your application process, in your life. You need to know who you are. And then you need to run with it. Do not try to be something that you're not. You might run a little bit forward with it, but you will falter and fall. Being true to yourself is highly essential. If you want to succeed in life, that is. Right. That's a really interesting take. I do experience experience it a lot in my own life. Moving on to the next question. Um, Courses or... Degrees in America are known to be very rigorous and hands-on, practical-based. So, how was your experience at Sunny? Okay, so you are absolutely right. Education system here is 360, apart from what we have in India. <laughs> uh, they have flipped it all over. In India, we uh, tend to focus more if you can memorize things. Yeah, exactly. Here, if you can perform in the field. Right. So, came here, in my first freshman year, the first year mm-hmm. I had, every assignment I submitted came back in red ink. Every sentence I wrote, grammatical errors, spelling mistakes, did not understand what an inverted pyramid is. Uh, it was very disheartening the first year because when I was leaving India, my English professors, they were like, oh, you're going to be real. <laughs> You are, you are a really good writer. You will just fly there. It's going to be fine. But when I came here, it was like a smack in my face. Everything I submitted came back red. So right. the first trip was absolutely horrible. Uh, I think I failed two classes. Not going to lie. Uh, one class I failed because I just, did, I just didn't attend the class. I was too lazy to wake up at 8.30. Another class I failed because I was not good enough that year. I did not understand mm-hmm. how to write journalism. Uh, but from the second year, I got a good professor. The professor I came to Sony for, he started teaching me. He taught me how things work. He taught me that it's not just about writing. It's about going out, understanding, and then writing. You need to do the legwork. In journalism, writing is secondary. Doing the legwork, the reporting is the primary thing. 
that is what you have to focus on and it, i don't know it just hit me and i started putting more energy in talking to people finding out sources understand mm-hmm. the problem and once you have done that writing is so easy it just flows automatically and then things just change all the time right you speaking about groundwork your really long list of internships and jobs that you've been doing the yeah. first was that of an associate assistant producer while covering the midterm elections in new york i mean that really sounds interesting for a person uh, like me how was that experience yeah that was very interesting uh, so this was like my second year in the uni and the first year was 2016 elections mm-hmm. uh, and i did not understand the american political system back then i was very new to the country i was also very trashy at my work so there was no way i could have done anything uh by the time 2018 midterm elections rolled around i was mm-hmm. the best in the school and the school was hosting this um and how about i say covering event right so we mm-hmm. had a room we had a broadcast room and everything and the professors they were like we should cover uh the midterm election results on long island the beautiful thing was that long island only has two counties so students can actually cover it and then we connected it to the national poll meter mm-hmm. like c cnn and all of that so we got data from there but our agenda was covering long island midterm elections yeah. uh, i wanted to be involved in it because i am really into politics i read a lot about it I have very strong opinions about it so i told my professor i want to do it and he said that it's actually for junior and senior year people i was a sophomore and i mm-hmm. said that let me do anything i'll get you coffee just let me do it and he was like fine just come when we are doing it so i went through the process we figured out how we are going to tackle that specific evening and they told me that we're going to be the ap my task was mostly standing on the floor uh, and seeing if everything is being recorded properly if the report is need anything if i need to go back to control room and um, that's what we did another thing that i did that evening was collecting data and that is the first time i realized how essential data is mm-hmm. because we cannot put out false information there right so, every time a county flipped we got the results of a county i had to triple check it from three different sources the whole week so that's another thing i learned that we need to be absolutely spot on with the information that you're giving out right so after that the jobs you were doing were as an economics writer at modern treatise yeah. another as a news reporter at the osprey So how was your experience of like you said of getting information data from sources and then piecing it together into a piece that's ready for publishing can you like put it in a step by step approach sure. uh so i am a business reporter by my beat and the first thing that i usually do when i have to cover a story is read as much on it as you mm-hmm. can read anything about that topic and really understand what the problem is the second thing after that is try to figure out who are the people who can give you good pieces of information about the topic that you're trying to write and start sending out cold emails to them okay the success rate for that is less than 10% mm-hmm. i even see it around in my school nowadays uh people send out like five emails and they don't hear back and they like oh my god i cannot do this too no one is getting back to me i right. send out 50 emails in the hopes that five people will get back to me so you need to cast a very wide net you right need to work very hard to get sources mm-hmm. once you get a source you can establish a relationship with that source and you have a source for life then it's mm-hmm. like a snowball effect right but initially you need to put in a lot of effort in figuring out sources so i start sending out cold emails i talk to as many people as possible this is very essential 
no matter what you are reading you are reading research papers news articles about any topic that's good mm-hmm. but in the end people are the ones that tell the story there right. has to be human element in the story mm-hmm. so we talk to as many people as possible try to understand every person you're going to talk to they're going to have a different lens to look at the same problem right so more different perspectives you can gather the better once you have multiple perspectives start eliminating the ones that you think are not really nice that are not adding much to the story mm-hmm. it has been covered before it has been reported to death is just right. in what was written somewhere else mm-hmm. right and not unique perspectives and you have your story right how do you choose a topic to cover is it something that you think that's under reported but then there's not so much information available out there so how do you choose everyone i have worked for every professor i have worked for has asked me this question and i really don't know uh the things that i pick on writing about they're usually very intriguing and they are plain as day for me but mm-hmm. people really look in that direction i i do not know what i can say is that talk to people talk to anyone and everyone the more you talk the more you will understand what problems they are facing what's happening in their life and mm-hmm. remember no one is ever facing a problem in isolation that never happens if mm-hmm. one person is facing a problem there is bound to be at least n number of other people who are facing the same problem right not come across that right mm-hmm. we live in a very tight human network so mm. one person will always speak to a larger audience so right people try to figure out what's happening just yesterday i was talking to someone and i got a really good story idea out of it a really good one i'm going to talk to my professor about it because i do not know a lot about it and i tried reading about it but i still want to know more about it and she's an expert in Uh, financial journalism so i'm going to bother her a bit about it and i'm going to see what she thinks and if the story is viable i think it's very viable i just got it from a conversation that's how i usually pick my stories be very observant and that's it so do you consciously make conversations that will lead you to something that you can write about or is it something that just happens uh i really like talking to people mm mm-hmm. Uh, and that is it i'm willing to talk to anyone and everyone uh, and i usually pay attention to what they are saying the more i like the person the more attention i'm going to pay to them because i know that they have good perspective of life so if i'm talking to someone on the street i'm still going to be very attentive but my attention graph will spike the moment they say something very interesting that i haven't heard before so that's what that's how i go about it like having fleeting conversations with anyone if you are in the elevator with someone unknown just ask them how's your day what's popping um uh if it's like a long elevator ride right? pick out any random topic right just be like oh did you see what's happening with the new pathan so what are you doing so just ask them that's it people right. bet it you need to ask uh someone told me not long ago that people love talking about themselves which mm. is very true so you just need to ask ask in a good way like don't right. judge but <laughs> do ask okay i think that's one of the skills that uh, journalists or reporters need to have that you need to be outgoing and put yourself out there ask people about how they're doing to be conversational so okay, can you outgo- huh that's i that's a misconception that people have that you need to be outgoing and stuff you just need to be open to conversations be right. loud and being open to conversations is hell of a difference okay anyways the question was uh can you name the very basic skills that you think a journalist should have and should develop a good spine first and foremost you need to have some girth and leg 
you cannot blow with the wind yeah if you are blowing yeah. with the wind do not come into this profession go be a right. market or something that mm-hmm. is very 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 essential you need to stand on your morals because this profession will give you opportunities every single day for you to crash your morals in the pen and move right. forward do not do that be open to conversations even if you are talking to someone that has a different perspective to a problem right mm-hmm. like if i'm talking to someone i think healthcare and education should be free for all a lot of people don't feel so they say no it should not be how will people make money out of it and what not do not get riled up and get pissed like, oh my god how can you not see this it's common sense and whatnot. try to understand their perspective that is essential being open to conversations mm-hmm. and develop a very hard nose man people are going to slam a lot of doors on your face uh, <laughs> it's really difficult but develop a hard nose if you really want to stick in this field you need to have a very hard nose and, and for I writing was, yeah that's what i was going to come to I was, i'm not going to say that you need to be a phenomenal writer to mm-hmm. be a fashion no i have read so many articles that have been written in such a trashy manner that my lord it does not deserve to be in the new york times i swear it really does not it's that horribly written but the reporting that went into it and no mm-hmm. of the charts remember we are trying to dish out information we're not trying mm-hmm. to be it's the right. sweet spot for sure if you are a really good reporter and a really good writer for sure man like you're golden in this profession then but our priority number 1 is dishing out information in a way that an average consumer can understand it mm-hmm. that's you do not have to be the best writer on the planet for this if you are wow that's really good keep at try right. so you're saying the basics is to find information and put it out there to the audience in a way that they can understand yes. but uh i think in the journalism industry there's been a lot of change with uh, the advent of social media there's a yes. lot of short form pieces coming out right as opposed to the long form journalism that was traditionally there in a lot of publications i've read the new yorker the new york times right really really long pieces that you can like read for hours and hours and somewhat i don't click with the short form pieces because i think they don't you know paint a complete picture for me what's your take on both those kinds of journalism okay uh, as for social media nothing is all good or all bad right uh, social media has a lot of positives but we cannot disregard the negatives of it it does give dish out information in a sentence or two like go on hmm. twitter you don't need to yeah. read an entire article you need to read a tweet but remember yeah. the information you are getting from a tweet is only limited If you really want to know what's happening about that topic, you need to read an entire story. I'm a big fan of long form writing. I really like it. That's what I really like to do. And these magazines, the New York Times, Business Week, uh, Economist, they do long form writing. They don't. Right. Do yeah. And it long form writing is way more difficult than short form writing because. In short form writing, you are dishing out fact, 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 fact. Mm. A sentence is a fact in itself, and you're done. Long form writing, you need to have a lot of characters. Let's say it's a ten thousand word story, right? Mm. Eight of each story. You need to have at least fifteen characters in that, and they cannot right. just story and go in the story. There has to be a character builder. You need to dish out some information about the character. so very detailed reporting goes into long form there is a very good understanding by the reporter who has done that story so right not reading a press release and typing it mm. now there is an ai can do that then the reporter is really understanding the problem is really understanding the characters involved in the story and then dishing out you the information and i think it's a more enjoyable read because indeed I just find it beautiful, man. It's really good. So. But then that's the take of people who like to read. Like for example, I have 
been going to the British Library since I was a kid, and I really love reading, so I don't mind reading a and really long article. As opposed, people are like, we don't have time. We have one minute. Just give us whatever happens in one minute. I know. Uh, people like you are a dime breed. I'm not gonna lie. And I know. It's really sad. Uh, I'm a big fan of reading too. I used to read a lot of books. Uh, I I do not know what to say to those people who say that give me the information in one minute. Yeah, you can get the information in one minute, but you cannot get the understanding of the topic in a minute. And I think everyone has a few topics in their life that they really want to understand. Mm, yeah. Not everyone is going to be interested in anything and everything under the sun. Hmm. Right? Like if you give me a magazine about fashion week, I will not care. I just right. care. Because that's not my beat. Nothing wrong with it, but someone else will care about it. I want that information in a minute. I will not spare a minute and one second more because I'm not interested in it. But if you give me a magazine about the state of the global economy, how the Indian economy is functioning, what's happening to the U.S. Federal Reserve, I'm going to spend hours just because I want to read it. So. people usually who say that get this shit out to me in a minute they're usually not interested in the topic that's what right. they mean when they come across a topic that they're really interested in i think they would like to read longer forms and regardless i tell everyone that you should read a lot because you can go to the gym for your physical health exercise but what about the brain you need to read to exercise your brain that's what i think might be wrong i don't know speaking about the two types of journalism your most recent uh, post is that of a news editor at the daily brief and i've been through <laughs> i've been through the app a couple of times and it's like really really short form news so how yep. do you how do you do that being a fan of long form journalism yourself well I can say you got a survey. Yeah, you need you need to fill your tummy. <laughs> so, uh, honestly, it's not uh, my uh, responsibilities. There were very different from the publication where I was working before that. I was an AE, and we used to cover short form stories, well, not short form, mid form stories and long form stories. So I could dabble with everything, and the reporters I had in my team, I could. If there is a really short story, we just need to cover the press release. I would dish it out to them. I would not touch it. But here at the Daily Brief, uh, they understood they, that they are catering to a different market. Mm-hmm. Uh, when in here for industry dive, we were writing news for bankers and regulators, the people who make regulation. Mm-hmm. They may. Uh, Used to cater to the audience that does not have a lot of time to read news. They want it in bullet points. They were kind of running on the access news model. Mm-hmm. The news publication here, uh, they give you news in bullet points. They also have longer form stories, but majority of the news they give out is in bullet It's points. Bullet points. Easy to digest. You can read it quickly. And you can run with it. And that's what Daily Brief was targeting. They were mm-hmm. targeting. specific audience and that publication was very heavy on a lot of quantity the right quality from what i understood by the time i was working there they were like uh, you can maybe hold a story for a few minutes mm-hmm. dish out quality but do not forget that we cannot just put out one story a One really good story at the end be done with it, and like, oh my God, we killed the market today. That's not going to happen. Yeah. We need to dish out quantity. The more exactly. news we can give out to people, the more clicks we will get. Now that's the kind of media business I absolutely hate. Nothing wrong with the Daily Brief. They're actually doing good work. They're still making people read news, which is phenomenal, which is highly essential. But I do not like running after clicks. I have never mm. run after. Absolutely hate it. But we had to dish out a lot of quantity for that, and that's what the daily brief was doing. Right. So you said you really like, you know, having an opinion about politics. You're really into politics and business both. 
and most yeah. of your articles have been on a i mean although they mainly correct uh, speak about business there's a lot of peripheral work that's also about the social context so yeah. how did you choose to you know specialize as a business journalist so this again i'll go back to what my professor said i hear it from everyone i have worked with like everyone who has some experience all of my professors who have loved me they have always told me where the people tell stories numbers will give you the truth but people will tell the story a balance sheet will never tell the story right it's just a balance sheet what's happened to the company what's happened to the people behind the balance sheet that is the mm-hmm. story the balance sheet is just there for you to tell that okay this is the number they are really struggling but you need to figure out people so i really run after people even when i'm covering business stories people add color to the story and that color is highly essential and whenever you are covering people social context is bound to be there because we are social creatures in the end so every story i try to do i try to find that who is the segment of the society that's going to be impacted by the story mm-hmm. who are the people who are going to care about the story and that's how i e- even pick my sources that's how i shape my story that's how i do my reporting the people who will really care about this tiny slim mm-hmm. society right so you first you're saying you first pick out a niche audience and then you go about the other things uh, first i find a good idea right uh like okay i can give you a live example maybe can I, maybe i can explain it better like that yeah. uh, just yesterday i was talking to someone about how currencies flow from mm-hmm. the us market to the african subcontinent there is a legal banking channel and then there is a black market channel mm-hmm. and i want to cover that because okay. that is i actually horrible for the african subcontinent it will destroy the economy in the longer run because mm-hmm. if the black market persists the government cannot make funds from every single transaction their foreign reserves will go to trash and this is just the understanding i have from a 15 minute conversation i got to read two articles i need to talk to my professor about it she knows way more than me so this is just a story now i want to cover this story because yes the african subcontinent will care about it but i believe that every third world country on this planet will care about it because every third world country has this problem even india has this problem even india has a very big black currency market that just flies under the radar uh, an average person does not know about it because they do not care and when they understand that why they should care the government will suffer their foreign reserves will die down over time then right. they will stop caring about it So that's the point of the story. It's not only about oh USD is flying from here to there. No, USD is flying from here to there. Why do I care? Because you are gonna suffer in the end. That's mm-hmm. why you should care, and that's the human element of it. Right, making people understand what's yes. going on around them. Yeah. Now coming to Colombia. Yeah. How do you how is your experience of studying journalism at Columbia it's one of the most premier universities in the world especially for journalism it's yeah. like the dream college I know uh, so I heard man <laughs> not gonna lie <laughs> so I had this mentor uh, the first real finance uh, internship that I did was at Acuris Global I was mm-hmm. covering the debt market uh, the mortgage market credit uh, legal obligations like everything related to debt right and i found this really amazing editor there she taught me everything about financial reporting from mm-hmm. scratch i did not even know the full form of rmbs when i walked into that office and what might that be uh, residential mortgage backed securities Uh, I can explain it to you if you want. Uh, let's say a lot of people have mortgages. What banks do is they bundle these mortgages mm-hmm. and they sell it to a third party. The idea is that they, when you sell these mortgages to someone else, you free up your balance sheet 
from right. the liabilities and you get some cash back which you hmm. can reinvest in your business the issue is <laughs> that yes this does happen but you're distributing the liability throughout the economy and that's why we had the 2008 financial crisis mm-hmm. really horrible mortgage backed securities were circulating everywhere on the planet one tank and it pulled everyone together with it so it has its positives and negatives you have to do it very cautiously that that's the beat of this so she taught me everything about this literally everything and i look up to her as my mentor whenever i'm struggling in this field whenever i do not know what to do i ping her and I'm like yeah we got a talk now and she said so i talked to her i think last year she told me apply to columbia mm-hmm. uh, why should i do that i'm already in american university i got accepted there it's in dc and the place i was working for in dc they told me i'll come back to dc we'll pay for your education and uh-huh. stuff just work for us just mm-hmm. be see and she said no we got to go to columbia when you go there you will understand she is a graduate of columbia herself i think she graduated in 2015 or something something like that mm-hmm. so she is a graduate from here she really pushed me and i applied for it and i got in some but how was your experience there what do you think were your key learnings throughout your time at columbia mm-hmm. have been here for 4 months let me be honest i just came here in august this is the first semester that i'm here mm-hmm. and i'm graduating in next semester it's a one year course of course it's yeah fast paced course uh the learning is i think they really tend to dive deep so i'm in the ma program when you have mm-hmm. you're a mid level uh, journalist you have some experience underneath your belt right. in the ma program so for the people experienced people they really dive deep in the beat that you want to work on they will not teach you basic journalistic skills like how to do an interview how to run a camera you know they expect you to know all of that how to find sources you should know that they will dive very deep into the concepts of the beat you want to report on like i'm a business reporter so we dive very deep into how the economy functions what are the securities that are being traded in the market how do you cover the corruption mm-hmm. how do you cover globalization how do you cover horrible trade deals that countries do all the time so these are the things that they teach us and i loved it i'm not going to lie i loved it it's really good going into the specifics yes. of your particular genre yeah i call it a beat yes okay that's a nice word a beat Okay, moving on to the next question. Um you're an Indian person who's moved to America and is now a journalist. For a journalist, it's very necessary for you to have an authority over the things that you're speaking about, to have a deep knowledge about what you're writing about or speaking about. So, how did you, I mean, map the economics of United States? And do you find a kind of acceptance of your authority among your colleagues and among your audience? Well, my life in this scenario has been a weird spectrum. Mm-hmm. First time I came here, <clears throat> I wanted to be a politics reporter because I live and breathe politics. And a professor of mine, he told me very subtly, "Do not be a politics reporter. You are an American. No one cares about your political opinion. You are an outsider. Man. You can't even vote. Why should we care about your political opinion?" Which is very harsh. Not gonna lie, but absolutely true. Mm-hmm. It's really helpful in popping that bubble. Uh, he told me that I should be a business reporter because I can understand some basic market concepts. I studied economics, like you know, I studied commerce in eleventh and twelfth, so that gave me some penetration in economics. And mm-hmm. it, economics is very easy to me. I never really studied it, but I'm decent at it. So he told me that I should try this beat. and when i started reading the american economy the american market i did not understand anything honestly mm-hmm. i did not understand anything so i had to read a lot i had to read everything i can put my hands on i started from scratch i started from what an economy really is to 
what securities are being traded. It's a very wide spectrum. You have mm-hmm. to read about research papers, a lot of books, a lot of news articles. Sometimes there are going to be times where you will not understand what's written in a news article. Mm-hmm. Then you run to your expert. That is your professor or anyone else expert in the field. You dish it out to them and be like, explain it to me as if I'm a five-year-old kid. Right. And they explain it to you. Then uh, getting an authority over your voice, that is very difficult. The first year, the first year and a half, I was very timid. I was mm-hmm. scared to speak my mind and not because I did not know things well. I did not know things very well then. I'm not going to lie. But I was very scared that what if I'm wrong? What if I'm right. saying I don't want to be wrong. I would rather be quiet than being wrong. Right. But honestly, this I can just say this for myself. Success. Success is the only thing for me that has worked to gain authority over my voice. Once you say something and it's right, that builds confidence. You write something, it's right, it builds confidence. You argue about something and your professor or your editor is like, yeah, that point of view is absolutely right. You run with mm-hmm. it. That builds confidence. So it's like a snowball effect. The first few times you're going to fall, you're going to fall on your face for sure. But do not be afraid of that. Like, chill out. <laughs> the more uh, good stories you put out, the more confidence you will develop in yourself. I'm being told that I'm highly overconfident nowadays because, man, I'm good at my work. What can I say? But I don't think it's overconfidence. It's really, people really look at it in a wrong sense. I think it's very much self-awareness. I know what I'm speaking about because I've spent years reading about it, mate. You have read an article. I've been covering it for years. Right. It really is about the amount of work you put into your beat and getting successful stories out of it. It's not going to happen that every story you do is going to be successful, no. But whatever stories that are successful, Mm -hmm. they will build up your confidence like no tomorrow. Right. So, you would say keep trying and keep building up. For sure. Do not be afraid to fall. Do not be afraid to fall. People get scared, right? Uh, Maybe... The pitch a story and the professor shoots it down in the first instance. And like, That's a stupid idea. It's fine. It's fine. No one was born with a lot of great story ideas. Right? Right. You read a lot. You read a lot. Uh, let's say the Fed hiking the interest rates. Right? Everyone mm-hmm. on the planet is covering that. The Fed hiked 50 basis points. That's one story. Everyone is covering it. You read every story that has been covered on it. And then you try to find a different angle that no one has looked at. Maybe you can say the Fed hiking the interest rates is killing the crypto market. You should chill out. I don't know. Like find something unique and do not be afraid to pitch that unique idea. Mm -hmm. It might function, it might not function. But think about it, what if it functions? Then you have a really good story at your hand. So, the most recent positions that you've held have been of a news editor. Now, the editor is like the topmost person in a media organization when it comes to publishing stuff. I mean, I've heard that. (laughs) So, uh, what can you, uh, I mean, can you speak about your experience as an editor? What are the tasks that you have to do on a daily basis? Yeah, so, I see it everywhere, right? People don't want to be reporters anymore. They're like, I want to be an editor. Yeah. <laughs> it's a fancy <laughs> title. Yeah, it's a, it's, it is a fancy title. But mate, you have no personal life. <laughs> Let me tell you that. I've been working as an editor for more or less two or three years. The last mm-hmm. two positions I had, I was an editor. Before that, when I was working for Buttonwood Tree, uh, my editor left us like high and dry. He just dipped up. Uh, he got a better position and he left us. So I managed that beat for three, four months as an editor. That was my first real experience of working as an editor. I was just thrown into it. No handbook. No one is going to teach you. You just need to manage this beat. I was 23. I was 22 for the Butterfoot Tree. And I literally learned it on the fly. I just had this one idea that 
the news cycle will not stop no matter what we push out stories every day we push mm-hmm. out one or two stories every day quality stories mm-hmm. it will not stop i used to give my reporters assignments that you cover this you cover that if they were unable to pull through in time then i would have to write it myself because i will not let the news cycle stop mm-hmm. so i was always on the edge of my seat and right so i need to get a story by 5 pm but mm-hmm. what at 4:50 the boy emails me and says i have no sources i couldn't do the story now i am in a pickle <laughs> do how do you write the story in 10 minutes yeah <laughs> so that did happen a lot uh, the first time i was working as an editor maybe because i didn't have experience i didn't know how to manage people and what not but over time i learned that i need to rely more on my reporters i should not just give out stories to them i should give them a path of how to report on the stories mm. so I, exp- i experimented with that a bit i used to give them a story i used to tell them okay from what i am envisioning in this story i, I want you to have the comments of the pet i want you to have the comments of an economist and a commercial bank because this decision is going to impact all three uh, go find it out let me know in the next few hours if you're finding it difficult to find sources Mm-hmm. If they found it difficult to find find sources, I used to take out my address book, dish out some names, and give them the contact to like talk to them. But get these three responses. You get these three responses, the story is done. Sometimes even that didn't pan out. Then I had to do the story myself. I was like, okay, you work on something else. Let me do this. So being right. is a lot of stress. Uh, you have no personal life, or maybe I didn't have one. Some people are better at managing it. I don't know. you are under a lot of stress all the time that what if my reporter does not pull through with the story you have no working hours it's not mm-hmm. like you work right you are you might be working from 9 to 10 or 12 to 12 there is no working hours because your agenda is to keep the news cycle functioning it should not stop a reporter's job on the other hand which i have started appreciating more since i became an editor you get one story and you just have to run after that story right i can buy a story with a lot of grammatical errors and be done with it like i, I did my job you are <laughs> you need to figure it. so and they have more of brain space to really run after the story do some investigation find a new angle and stuff and editor he is more like stories are coming i need to edit it i need to push it out they're coming edit it push it out So they're different things. Everyone wants different things. Right. It. So as an editor, do you just trust your reporters, or do you have to go through the entire fact check process again? Uh, so this is what I do. Right. Uh, every editor functions differently. Uh, the first time I get a new reporter, I do not trust them. Uh, it's maybe a me problem. Little faith in people. Uh, I've been told. and i've learned it myself too through harsh experiences in this field people lie through their teeth all oh. the time in journalism your sources right even reporters lie there have been so many instances when reporters fabricated stories absolutely fabricated them just so that they can have a sassy headline so people, do you think that's the root of the entire fake news no then this is a very tiny sliver of people uh-huh. fake news is more about sensationalism very okay. few people is actually lie very few because they understand if they lie they will be served with a lawsuit and then they are really done yeah fake news nowadays is do you don't call yourself a reporter mm-hmm. you can dish out anything on social media anything there are no repercussions absolutely none so you can say anything and get away with it and you hope that whatever you have said it catches on in the cycle and it blows mm-hmm. up right like covid right. mistaken the vaccines will kill you that was a very big thing in america mm-hmm. it's absolute fake news a lot of the publications that ran with this news they got sued but people on social media independent creators who ran with this news very few of them got sued majority mm-hmm. of them came out of it unscathed they know there are no repercussions you can run after big media houses 
we cannot track down every single independent creator that is a right thing. so fake news is an entirely different different thing altogether very scary man <laughs> that thing scares me so much uh for my reporters i do not trust them the first time i have a new reporter i need to build a rapport with them so mm-hmm. the first few stories that i'm editing from them i'm going to check every single thing and by the time maybe like fifth or sixth story if there are no major issues like if they have gotten a statistic wrong they just copy it from fine man chill there are some grammatical errors it's okay uh the quote was uh, tweak the bit to make it flow in the story absolutely horrible don't do that uh maybe you added an adjective like the and a which no worries but do not change the meaning of the quote if you do that now it's difficult for us to work together right so very rarely it has happened that i found reporters that have been lying mm-hmm. honestly never really happened with me so once i build trust with them the more trust i have the less rigorous checking process they go through by the time i build trust with them i will just randomly check two three things and if they are spot on i think that it's good to go and usually we do have a copy editor so <laughs> the copy editor helps me to so keep a check on things yeah the more check you have on things the better that's the idea and maybe i might miss out something that's why we need another pair of eyes as mm-hmm. i said whatever information you are dishing out has to be absolutely spot on no mistake in the information if you have yes. dished out anything false you need to take a hard look at yourself mate It's not cool in this profession mm-hmm. how is your process of pitching a story to someone oh who is so, authority of course yeah uh to pitch a story i usually pitch stories that i find interesting mm-hmm. and i read a lot about it as you were asking right how do you get authority in your voice you read a lot man you study a lot you know you try to know everything about that topic and that mm-hmm. is it so when i'm pitching a story the first thing i do is find something that's interesting for me because if it's interesting to me it's going to be interesting for someone else too right then i start reading i literally dive into reading and sometimes it happens that i thought that the story is going to be interesting and i read and i like nah, nah it's not that interesting actually kind of boring but usually you find more things that are interesting in the story and then i go to my editor and i'm like so do you know about this and if the editor is like ha huh, i did not know and like let me write it and they're like oh, go for it and if they like yeah i know about it don't be a kid don't run after it don't waste your time or my time find something else okay that's how it go about right i think that was the last major question what oh. is your advice for the next generation of journalists hmm i think this was a completely i mean this episode was completely filled with a lot of advice key sentences that i can pick out but then again advice is good for them because i function very differently mm-hmm. i'm a goal and task oriented person uh, i don't know if my advice would resonate with majority of the people or even my thought process will resonate with majority of the people i, I don't know i hope my, my advice was good but for the upcoming crop the first thing i would tell them is no thyself no your mm-hmm. and develop some good thing like the authority you want in this profession you will get it over time the harder you work the more authority you will have uh for if i have to ballpark a number in authority terms you need to spend 18 hours a day for a few months or a few years study your beat then you will have absolute authority over it you will not be scared to talk to anyone bring any expert in front of you you will be able to talk to them but if you like oh i read two articles and i came here to talk to you they will shake your roots like no tomorrow you need to understand everything about your beat you have to work hard for that authority so read a lot do not be afraid to read uh 
and do not come into this profession to be famous or make money because you will not make money in this profession very few do very few do and if your agenda is to be famous uh, then you will run after sensation and facts rather than what's important and essential so really know what you want in life and have some thick skin because you're going to be shot down way more than you're going to be patted on so right. have a very thick skin like if you want sources you need to hear no from at least 100 to find five good and that is a fact but if you're like oh i reached out to 10 people and no one is willing to talk to me i don't want to do this story this profession is not meant for you 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 need to be very 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 persistent if you're not persistent being a good reporter is going to be hell of a difficult you mm-hmm. need to be persistent um, that's this this sounded like warning so one last question again yeah. what was your best experience working in the industry something that you know you felt was really fulfilling eye opening for you stimulating so i've done a lot of stories and they have been published in very bizarre places some of them have won national awards for me but the best experience that i had was in my undergrad days the story that i was telling you about uh there was a thing a girl filed a complaint to campus that a professor uh, sexually abused her and the uni actually did nothing about it right they just swept it under the rug and a few students were protesting about it in front of our president back then stand uh, he was giving an address and they were protesting about it no one really covered it and i felt very angry i was like man this is so stupid i am a cover and i covered that and that's the story that got me recognition on campus i have done a lot of stories in my life really good ones but that story has to be the best one i've done because it really made an impact and that story really made me realize that there is some power in the pen mm. a lot of the times we write a lot of things like this leader is not really good people try to understand but that leader comes back and gets reelected right so yeah. lot of we fail we do fail because maybe we are unable to make people understand mm. that story really made me understand that now nah, there is some power in the pen we just need to understand how to leverage it and i'm only 25 i'm still learning how to leverage it hopefully by the time i die <laughs> i know how to leverage it <laughs> we'll see about that okay it was a really nice and stimulating experience talking to you thank you so much for this insightful episode all right thank you for having me and i hope it goes well let me know all right thank you so much for watching this video i hope you found this podcast insightful please hit the like share and subscribe buttons down below tell us what you felt about this episode and suggestions for our upcoming episodes in the comment section below we'll be back with a brand new and insightful episode soon enough thank you